Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for um, the move of the Holy Spirit and his presence here in our midst, especially in the last two weeks. As the church has been gathering together, fasting and praying, let us continue to be in that attitude of seeking the Lord's presence uh, in and through the service and especially through the word of God this morning. Let us read um, James chapter 5, 1 through 6. We are, con are continuing in the series of uh, over the book of James. And uh, we, have, we are now on the last chapter of James. James chapter 5, 1 through 6. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have Fatten your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. If you have driven on the road of any bit of time, you have encountered the scenario where you're trying to turn left or right to a lane, and you take a quick look on your side mirror, and everything looks good. And as you turn, you get a honk, or a, you, you see a car just whizzing past you and you realize that this car was in this perfect spot called the blind spot and and uh, so it doesn't matter how experienced of a driver you are but these blind spots exist uh, while we drive and and unless you're keenly observing the road at all times and you're watching every car coming behind you and and uh, aside you it, it is really hard to sometimes pay attention to those blind spots. And thankfully now we have technology in cars that, that give us indication when this happens. But when we look at our spiritual life and we look at our Christian life, there are also a lot of blind spots like this. When we, when, as we live out this Christian life here in Oklahoma, which is in the middle of the Bible Belt, and, and relatively each of us uh, in different ways are prosperous, um, we tend to only focus things that are in our field of vision. So in our limited field of vision, we might focus on the life troubles that, that feed our, our private anxieties. We might focus on the safe and com comfortable life, maintaining that. We might focus on, uh, uh, we might struggle with jealousy and comparison because we see others doing better than us. And, and while at the same time, in our blind spot, there are millions of people that are, that are struggling to get by. They're struggling to make ends meet. They're going through unfathomable crises that, that, that need our help and, and support. The dangerous part of this spiritual blind spot is that it can, it can be pervasive into other areas of our life. Of course, it starts always with the personal holiness it starts with the, the care for the riches of this world, but it can grow to a point where if it's not recognized or addressed, we can be in a danger zone. And as we've been hearing in these past couple of weeks, and especially this morning, it is the life in the spirit that enables us to, to widen our, our vision, to see the full vision of what God's heart is for this country, what God's heart is for our lives, what is God doing in and through our life and, and, and to be able to see even past the blind spots, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So as we dive into these verses, you know, th these are really tough verses uh, to, uh, you know, to, re to speak from, uh, especially as we are, uh, you know, focusing on uh, a, a special time to, to really come draw closer to the Lord and to to walk in the spirit and this doesn't right away seem like one of those kind of verses to use or to to speak from but when we look at these verses and if you read through the old testament if you read the the verse the words of jesus you see similar themes 
come up front. The Old Testament prophets, many of them spoke against this very same, this oppression, this injustice by the wealthy and the powerful. And when, so when we hear these words as like justice and oppression and poverty, all of a sudden in our very politically charged environment, we start thinking about different parties and all this stuff. And, and, and that is not where I'm going today. As we, as we think about the Word of God, we need to see the Word of God as well-balanced. You know, when, when we think of the Bible, we cannot assign a particular uh, political party or a persuasion or a theory. The, you know, as, as the angel was before Joshua, right, and, and Joshua asked, whose side you're on, the angel said, I'm on neither side. So the Word of God cuts straight through. The Word of God does, calls out the, the, the problems in all sides and the Word of God stays neutral, but also cutting to every person in an individual way. We don't hear about this often in pulpits, mainly because of that. It's, it's very controversial, and, 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 and this topic is not something that we definitely don't want to hear from often. Um, let me just read one example from Jeremiah chapter 22, 11 to 17, which it, it kind of highlights this very same theme. I'm not going to speak from it. I'm just going to read it just so that you see similarities. Jeremiah chapter 22, 11 through 17. Jeremiah says this uh, through the Lord. This is for this is what the Lord says about Jehoaz, who succeeded his father, King Josiah, and was taken away as a captive. He will never return. He will die in a distant land and will never again see his own country. And the Lord says, what sorrow awaits Jehoiakim, who builds his palace with forced labor, builds injustice into its walls, for he makes his neighbors work for nothing. He does not pay them for their labor. And he says, I will build a magnificent palace, palace with huge rooms and many windows. Here's Jehoiakim saying, I will build. If you remember last, uh, the week message, or the me message from Minu, this presumption of I will without mentioning God's sovereignty. And he goes on to say, I will panel it throughout with fragrant cedar and paint it with a lovely red. But a beautiful cedar palace does not make a great king. Your father Josiah also had plenty to eat and drink, but he was just and right in all his dealings. That is why God blessed him. Verse 16, he gave justice and help to the poor and needy, and everything went well for him. And here's the key verse. Isn't that what it means to know me, says the Lord? But you, you have eyes only for greed and dishonesty. You murder the innocent, oppress the poor, and reign ruthlessly. Doesn't it, doesn't, do, do you see similar themes in James between this the passage in James and what Jeremiah is saying through the Lord? How about the teachings of Jesus? Here's one example where we see similarities. Matthew chapter 6, 19 and 21. We went through this when we went on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and see, steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so that is why this message is important because this is a matter of the heart. This, this is key. However we want to push this aside, the matter of possessions and money and the love of money and the and, and how we use it and who and who we affect in our pursuit of money matters because this is deep in the heart of God to address this 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 fault in mankind now when we look at this passage in James this is not addressing believers this is addressing unbelievers there's a call to repent but it also seems like James is saying, if you look to the verses, that he's, he is, he's seeing as a foregone conclusion that these wealthy people who, in verse 4, they, they have held back wages, they defrauded their workers, and he's telling them, helping the poor. Instead of helping the poor, they have oppressed the poor. And verse 5, they, they have lived their own lives in luxury and self-indulgence. And James says, just after that, that their hearts are are fattened for the day of slaughter. So just imagine this vivid imagery of cattle. They're eating grass. They're feeding themselves. They're fattening themselves only to be slaughtered one day for meat. So this is the picture that James is giving to 
the those who are those who do not trust in the Lord, those who are presumptuous uh, about their own abilities, about their own wealth, they're like the the cat, cattle eating grass, not knowing what they're eating grass for is to be killed one day. This is the, showing the heinousness of the day of judgment. It is something to for us even to take heed of is that the day of judgment is not going to be a bed of roses, especially for those who are not in Christ. In verse 6, he says, These unbelieving, evil, rich people have condemned and murdered the righteous, and the righteous didn't resist them. This reminded me of the passage that we know of in, in Hebrews chapter 10, 32 and 34, 32 to 34. The righteous that allowed these things to happen did not resist. It's the same, it's almost the same uh, community of the, of the Jewish, uh, Jewish converts to Christianity or to, to the way. The author says, think back on those early days when you learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and, and were beaten. Sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So why did the righteous accept these things with joy? And this is a message, message for us. Because the same joy that was set before Christ is also, is also set before them. Jesus set this joy, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, as we're going to go back again to it, Luke chapter 6, 22 and 23. Jesus says this, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and sperm your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. And leap for joy, for your behold, your reward is great in heaven. So in the response of the righteous in the face of trials and difficulties is not political action, it's not a strike, but it is what? Joyful acceptance and joyful prayer. Praying for our enemies. It's a joyful acceptance in the fact that I have a sovereign God who knows what is happening to me. And I have a joyful peace in knowing that I am walking in the footsteps of Christ who was rejected by this world. If Christ was rejected by this world, so will I when I walk in Jesus' name. So I wonder how much of the heavenly rewards that could be stored for us isn't claimed by us because we weren't properly discipled in many ways to keep our, our giving, our fasting, our praying in secret, and, and not only that, but also taught to respond to these injustices that will come our way in the name of Christ with joy. It is hard to teach that, of course. Only when each of us encounter that in whatever form or fashion is when I think we will realize how to put this in practice. Because our first response is to retaliate. Our first response it's to, it's to call somebody, it's to complain about this, to post it on me, social media, to, share, to, to say, look at what is happening to me. And for the, the rest of this message, really, what I really want to focus on is on this phrase of laying up treasures. And we see that phrase in the last part of verse 3. You have laid up treasure for the last days. This day, uh, James is telling this to the unbelieving rich. This could be interpreted as if you're laying up treasures, anticipating things to go bad in your life. Or you're laying up treasures thinking that time will go on forever, but this is in fact the last days. Either way, this, this shows a blind spot, doesn't it? This shows a, a lack of awareness of, of where this, this person ought to be. So the question for us this morning is, where have we laid up our treasure in these last days? You know, a very practical advice that most young people don't heed to, but they should, is uh, when they start their careers, they should put aside a portion of their, their income towards retirement. If you tell that to a 23-year-old, a 24-year-old, they, 
are not really, they don't really care about what happens to them when they're 60 or 70. But what is told is that if you put, if you put even put a little towards retirement in your 20s, to the wonder of compound interest, this small amount will turn into a big amount 30, 40 years later when you're ready to retire. And, and it is true. It is true. I, I'm not here to give financial advice. But, you know, especially if your employer <laughs> matches your contributions, that's free money that you're losing. And again, we don't know how long God gives us this life. But the lesson here in an earthly sense is that if you are willing to put aside an amount of your income sacrificially today for 30, 40 years from now, that will benefit you to provide for your needs later. So if this principle is true in this life, on this earth, how much more should we heed to the teachings of Christ and the apostles about laying up treasures in heaven? These same people that talk about retirement plans, are they, they use this phrase called delayed gratification. You're delaying the big purchases and the, and the big expenses for maybe a time later down the line. They might not ever happen, but just delaying the gratification. And so how much more are we ought to think about the heavenly rewards and the delay, or many areas where we need to delay gratification for the sake of the kingdom? And so when we look at the, you know, one of the, there are a few verses where Jesus so words are quoted directly in the book of Acts. And one of them is, as you all know, Acts twenty thirty five. Jesus is quoted to say this. Paul is saying this. that it is, Jesus says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And the context of this is, as you can see on the screen, Paul is saying in the context that he worked hard as, as to be an example to help those in need, not only for to meet his own needs, but to meet others' needs. And, and so this, this whole ethic of meeting not only our needs, but others' needs is a, is a Christian ethic. And so Jesus here, is, it hasn't been recorded in any of the gospel sayings, but it, it very well could be a, a saying of Jesus. Why is it more blessed to give than to receive? It seems almost contradictory compared to the current teachings where you're told that you are blessed if you receive un, unexpected checks, unexpected rebates, unexpected refunds, and bonuses, and so on. And it's less of a blessing if you have money leaving your bank account, for whatever the reason may be. But as Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive here on earth because the temporary benefits of wealth that, that we receive on earth pales in comparison to the richness of the heavenly rewards that are in store for us. It cannot even be compared. Now, when we are, as I mentioned in the beginning, as we are driving in this limited vision, it might seem that the temporary, the benefits and the wealth of, of this earth seems to be all there is, but there's a blind spot brothers and sisters. And that is the reality of heaven. You know, because we live in America, there, there tends to be this tension, and I don't feel this tension myself, but I feel for many of you who have to go to India and all that, um, there's a slight, slight guilt that is imposed upon us because we live in America. Because we live in America, it's assumed that we don't know what it means to live without money, because in America we're told we cannot minister to the poor, we cannot minister in India, and so on. I mean, it's unfortunate because it, it, uh, it justifies jealousy and promotes a kind of shallow judgment or inferiority complex. And I, I know, I'm not, this is not something we obsess over, but you know, just sharing an observation based on what I read through social media comments in Malayalam, which is a dangerous place, uh, but I, I read this off and I see what is being said. But being prosperous is not sinful. And I'll, I'll, show, I'll show, of course, the words that each of us know. But there's apostolic teaching for those of us who, by God's grace, God's provision, we have what we need to survive. Paul tells us to Timothy, the pastor of the church in Ephesus, there are sevenfold commands. I'm just going to read them here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 9 to 19. It might be on the screen. As for the rich in this present age... You decide whether you're in that category. Charge them not to be haughty, 
or in other words, arrogant, proud, or conceited, nor set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And here's the key verse, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so they may take hold of what is, which is truly life. This is exactly what, what we've been talking about all along. It's storing up treasure as a foundation for the future. What is the future? It's not what's going to happen 30, 40 years from now. It's about heaven. It's about the rewards that we will receive in heaven that we have no sense of understanding of here on earth. Let me read some, some quotes from a couple of uh, men of God in history about, the, about giving. Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, said, I have held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Whatever I place in God's hands, whatever that God has given me and I place in God's hands, I, those things I possess by faith in heaven, I that is the rewards that are in store for me. Second is from Jim Elliot, the famous missionary. This is a little bit more complicated, and I'll try to break it down. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. Can we keep anything that is given to us? Really? I mean, is it possible to take our bank account with us, our possessions with us, if we suddenly pass away. But, so he gives what, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. To gain what he cannot lose. What is that? that, are the, that those are the rewards in heaven. There's much gain to be had when we think of the things above and think things of heaven. Compared to things on earth. So how many of us have looked at the possessions we have, the job that we have, the future per career progression that we have, the bank accounts that we have, and said to, the, said to the Lord, Lord, I let go of my grip on these things, and I place them in your hands. We should have a loose grip on everything that we possess. Ready to give at a moment's notice. This is, again, a sign of walking in the Spirit is ready to give. As, as the Spirit of God prompts you, just give. Because it's the Spirit of God that is prompting you. And it's a dangerous prayer, isn't it? To, to pray this prayer. Because we're letting go of control. We're letting go of, uh, uh, of, of being in control of this limited vision. To say, Lord, broaden my vision to see the things that are happening on this earth. To, to see what your heart breaks for, Lord. Break my heart for what breaks your heart, God. That is that, that is that sacrificial prayer that we're praying here. And as I conclude, I will invite the worship team to come forward. I'll end with this story. Uh, it's a, probably a well-known story. A man and his wife uh, were returning to their home in America after many years of serving as missionaries in Africa. And as their ship came closer to the shore, they heard loud cheers. And, and, uh, and so the man thought that for a moment that those are the people that are cheering them on, welcoming them back. But then they found out that the, the people out there were cheering for a celebrity that was on the ship with them. So this man who has a very seasoned ministry, missionary for many years, became frustrated. You know, he was able to, he shared with his wife his frustration. He said, we worked many, hard for many years and there's nobody to welcome us for our homecoming. And his wife's wife told him, we are not home yet. We're not home yet. So in the beginning of the message, I talked about blind spots. In the story of this missionary couple, the biggest blind spot for the man was forgetting where his true home was. When we finally reach home, what will we hopefully witness? Jesus will judge us for our works like the, with the fire, right? What, what, whatever will survive through that is what we have actually earned. And by his grace, he will tell us 
well done, good and faithful servant. He won't say, well believed, good and faithful servant. He won't say, well planned, well, well experienced, good and faithful servant. He will say, well done. It is action based. Our heavenly boards are based on our actions. But nonetheless, each of us will have varied amounts of rewards. But our focus, although we are Malayalis, won't be to compare one reward to another. But what, 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 was, what will be the focus of heaven? What will be the side of heaven? That each person in heaven, out of deep gratitude, out of deep joy, out of deep love in an act of worship, laying down their crowns and rewards at the feet of Christ, saying that only by your grace, only by your grace, only for your glory, only for your honor, only for your praise. At the, at the end of the day, our greatest reward, the reason why we want to store up treasures in heaven is so that we can lay it at the feet of Christ, that we can bring glory to Christ, to say thank you to the Lord. A means of saying thank you to the Lord is to store up treasures in heaven. To say, Lord, I was in darkness. I was in the pit. You lifted me up out of the pit, put me on a solid rock, you gave me a new song in my mouth, you gave me new life, and here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here's all the rewards you gave me back to you as an act of worship before you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, O God, for this morning. We pray, O Lord God. Lord, do a search within our hearts this morning, O God. If there are areas of idolatry, areas that we are holding back, O God, possessions, O Lord, areas that we have cheated others, O Lord. Lord, bring conviction as you brought conviction to Zacchaeus, O Lord God. Whoever we need to pay back, O Lord, let us pay back, O God, multiple fold, O Lord. Let us, O God, our, let our hearts break, O God, for the nations. Let our hearts break for the poor and the needy as it does, for, as it does your heart, O God. To see those who are oppressed and let it get, call some people, oh God, to, 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 to reach out and save those who are oppressed, oh God. Those who are going through uh, the trafficking, oh God, or, or other injustices on this earth, oh Lord. Or labor manipulation or whatever it may be, oh God. I pray that the, the, the young, men, young men, young women, old men, old women in this church, oh God, will be used, oh God, to bring deliverance, oh God, and to, and to bring your assurance of your kingdom on this earth, oh God. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.